Welcome to an all new episode of the Lisa Ann Experience. I am your host, Lisa Ann. I want to extend my gratitude to you for making me a part of your day, whether you're listening to me weekly. If you're a new listener, go back and catch up on what you've missed. Subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcast. And also know that I drop the video component every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern time on my YouTube channel, The Real Lisa Ann. Now, for a while, the every Friday at 2 p.m. really worked because we weren't back to work. And I've come to realize that people cannot sit in their office and watch a one hour plus YouTube video and sit in the chat and get away with it. So what I'm going to do and to not conflict with the NFL schedule, I had to put some deep thought into I can't do Thursday night because there's Thursday night football. I don't really want to commit over the weekend. Sorry, everybody, but I do try to let my weekends be time to get walks in the park with my friends, ride the city bike, and do like weekend things. Keep in mind that for a large portion of my life, my busiest time was weekends, being out on the road, doing events, and I am still doing some events here and there, but maybe one a month, next month, two a month. So they're kind of fun to get out, but football season, I don't leave. I'm not doing any events. I'm watching football. But now I get to live in this, like I work really hard Monday through Friday and those Saturdays I do like content management. So I have these different, but they're like laid back tasks. They're not like I'm putting makeup on and getting dressed and doing anything. I'm super casual. I'll go for a walk in the park, do a little work, work on my social media, but I don't want to commit. I know that was a really long winded way to tell you that the time is moving, but starting July, probably like the first week or after 4th of July, I'm moving the live premiere to 8 p.m. Eastern time. I know for some of you overseas, this is going to be a huge conflict and I took that into consideration and I'm really sorry, but yet I also know that like a lot of us don't go out on Friday nights anymore. I leave Friday and Saturday nights to the younger people, let them have their time. I had my time. So I'm home. And when I do my fantasy football Fridays, the 2 p.m. was like really tough because that really cut into like making lunch. I would be on the chat and like making lunch at the same time. So now I'm going to get to breeze through my fantasy football Fridays, get a nice little shower, put on my jammy jams and kick back with you all on my couch and really get into the live premiere. So July, the time will change to 8 p.m. Eastern time. I will remind everybody it's a really fun way to engage and get to know my community that's right here on my YouTube channel that sits in the chat and has so many great things to offer and say. I have a guest today I'm really excited about. This guest I got to see yesterday. So she did my podcast last week, we recorded, and then we scheduled me to do her podcast in person, got to go over to her apartment. We took a walk. We sat outside. We ate. We had a glass of wine, had a beautiful afternoon, uh, and it was just a nice escape, and I loved me building my little group of friends here uh, in the city since we're all back and everybody's doing things. So my guest today is also a very funny woman. So prepare yourself for some true comedy here because she is a comedian. Before I get to my guest, I want to thank everyone who played a role in contributing to me raising $3,300 for suicide prevention. The overnight walk was last Saturday and uh, it was a ton of fun. I ended up going by myself. I had a couple of people that were going to go with me and their schedules changed. And I thought to myself, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go alone. And as soon as I get there, I'm going to find other people alone and I'm going to bring us together and we're going to walk. So I get there and I check in and the greatest thing was check in. There was this woman, Marianne, Marianne, shout out to you. You gave me more confidence in my day than I had felt the whole day. Um, cause of course I was getting everybody's cancellations all day and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be doing this by myself. <laughs> okay. Um, not a big deal. And I get down there and I go over by the water. It was down at the Intrepid. So I go down to the water on Pier 84 in New York City. And there's these rocks you can sit on that are like, they're flat on the top, but they're like these shapes you can sit on. And so I see a woman sitting over here and then I see a woman sitting over here and they're alone. And I walked up to the first woman and I said, hello, uh, are you here alone? And who are you walking for? Because that was a big part of the conversation, suicide prevention. You saw a lot of families had pictures of their lost ones ironed onto the back of their shirts, taped onto their bags. Like it was, it was really something. And she said, yes, I am alone. I'm walking for my mother that committed suicide five years ago. And I said, stay here. I walk over to the other woman. 
are you alone? Who are you walking for? She said, yes, I am alone. I'm walking for a cousin and some friends. And she's also in uh, the mental health world in this space. So she's a counselor and helps a lot of people. And I said, okay. So I got their names and I said, okay, well, I'm alone too. And I'm walking for the tremendous amount of friends that I've lost along the way through the industry and through other walks of life. Let's all walk together and let's talk about our experiences. And so we walked together and we made friends and we are in a Facebook chat now and a little three person Facebook chat where we go and message each other. And um, it was really a great time to share our experiences, to walk together. One was from Pennsylvania and one was from New Jersey. So I felt like super guilty that I live here and it was so easy for me to get to Pier 84. And they went through taking a train or driving in and getting a hotel. And it was was just a really beautiful experience. 1,800 people walked through the city. Closing ceremonies were at 545 at Pier 84. It did not make the closing ceremonies. did make it, though, pretty late. Um, I Because once you get past your place, you're like, I'll just walk down uh, because another 45 minutes to go down and get a coffee was like, I was like, okay, it's come good now. But it was a great way to, for me to see parts of the city I've never seen, uh, to take photos of restaurants I want to eat at to walk in neighborhoods where I was like, oh, this is so beautiful. But it was also funny because it was a Saturday night and we ventured out on the walk at 845. And when we ventured out, there were a lot of people going out for their Saturday nights, wondering why we were taking up the entire sidewalk. I mean, 1800 people walking in packs each time a traffic light stops and everybody slows down. It kind of breaks up the pack a little bit, but it dispersed to be like a mile of us just walking and chanting and, and just, it was really, really powerful. And look, I made two new friends in a beautiful way that I can check in on. And especially, you know, around the times of the anniversaries of their loss, uh, see how they're doing with things. Anything new has come up, see if they're seeking counseling, all of these things. So the walk is called the overnight walk. They do them all over the U.S. You might want to look it up. And I want to thank everybody who contributed to helping me raise money. I'm really enjoying having this charity uh, element in my life and bringing you all closer and then me getting out there and doing these things. I feel every single one of your spirit and every single one of you with me when I'm taking these adventures. Because today's chat is a pretty long and funny chat. I'm going to get right into it with my guest today, who also has a podcast that I was just on and she's saving my episode till the 50th, her 50th episode, which is like in three weeks. I will remind you the podcast is called how to do drugs. So there's going to be a whole new element thrown into this podcast. My guest today, comedian, friend, former fellow friend from my past as well, Aliyah Janine. Another day, another amazing conversation to be had. This time I bring on a friend that I have known for years that I've recently reconnected with that made me laugh so fucking hard doing stand-up comedy that you can follow everything, AaliyahJanine.com. My friend, fellow comedian, uh, she's a comedian. I'm not that funny, uh, but we've known each other through many walks of life and now we're walking a new path. And I love that we reconnected. I Leah. know me too. How are you? You look great. You look great as always. <laughs> and I loved like, look, I've seen you do some, some shows in the past. Mm-hmm. And I tell you, when I got to see you at the stand, mm-hmm. I was dying. First of all, you've worked incredibly hard, mm-hmm. Uh, on your routine, on your stage presence, on your, your timing was really got me. Your timing is so good. How did you do it? How did you get from where you are, where you were, where we were kind of rolling around the industry (laughs) together to now having this comedic sense where the whole room was dying? Uh, I sold my soul to the devil. No, uh, (laughs) I killed a couple of children. No, um, worked. I just worked a tremendous amount. Um, You just have to go up. You need to get your reps in kind of thing. Uh, I work at the stand a lot. They were the first club to ever pass me. They're the first club to ever really give me a shot. Um, They've always supported me and um, all of my shenanigans. Well, most of my shenanigans. And uh, they let me host a weekly open mic there since their old location. This is their new location, which is beautiful. Um, 
It's beautiful. It's- I was shook. I, I, okay, so I hadn't been to the stand since it was at the old mm-hmm. location. Who knew that this stand was this mythical place with amazing gourmet food? Yeah. And, 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 and also, they didn't force me to buy two drinks. Yeah. It was a Tuesday night, and I didn't want to drink. Mm-hmm. It was the first comedy show I ever went to where they didn't force me to buy drinks. Yeah, there's no, there's no minimum there. There, there's no like like because most comedy clubs it's like a two item minimum either two drinks or food and a drink it's always two items which I get but yeah the stand they don't uh, they don't do that which is nice yeah because some people don't want to or they only want one or something like that but most of the time too when they don't have those like limits where where you have to have them more people will tend to drink more you know or, or tend to spend a little bit more money it's unlike the seller where I believe you're only allowed to buy three drinks or something like that. They don't want you because they don't want you to be um, too wasted, wasted, you know, and start heckling the comics. Because once you get a few drinks and a couple of people, they're like, I can do this. And that's, no, you can't. (laughs) How long does it take you to work out material till you feel like you're going to fucking nail it every time you get on stage? Oh, God. Um, Well, now it's getting easier. Now um, the the joke writing process, it's definitely easier. And and the performance and the timing, um, it gets easier with the open with open mics in general or bar shows and stuff like that. Um, It takes about maybe two, three times, you know, you, you reword some stuff, you move some stuff around, maybe you slow down, maybe you speed up in certain areas. But um, yeah, certain jokes, um, that are a little bit quicker, you know, I want to say maybe two to four times if it's a longer joke, um, definitely try to chop it up a little bit. You know, you want to keep it short and tight. You want less words as possible. And I have a habit of saying like a lot, but I, so much, I say like so fucking much. I realized, um, I didn't say it that much before quarantine, but I noticed after quarantine, it was every other word. And I, I maybe it's because of all the acid I did over quarantine. I don't know. <laughs> but I've been trying to cut like out of my vocabulary and use big girl words. <laughs> That's about it. So you turn into a valley girl. That's yeah. okay. I use so. I use so. so. And I, I – so, okay. And you learn it when you're like – Going through like, okay, so I'm, you know, editing my Mm -hmm. book and I go on to Grammarly and it'll give you a list of words and how many times you've used them. And I was appalled how many times I used so, you know, and I was like, what is, where did this come from? And then I realized even when I tweet, Mm -hmm. even when I write something, I'll catch myself. Yeah, it's the tweets because like it sounds funny, you know, in a tweet, but then you start (laughs) saying it in your real life because I had a problem with it when I was younger. And I switched it instead of saying like, I would do it's all. I would say it's all instead of like. So I've been trying to do that again to see if that helps. But I'm like, that's two extra words instead of just one word. (laughs) What comedians have you admired that you watched through the years that made you want to pursue comedy? Oh, wow. Um well, I um, in porn, I, you know Sam Tripoli, right? Of course, of course, of course. Of uh, course. Sam Tripoli with, with the Naughty Show. Um, he was the he was the catalyst that kind of pushed me into doing um, stand up. He didn't. Uh, well, he asked me one time for one of the shows uh, to do a five minute set, and then I ended up doing a wet T shirt concert uh, contest. <laughs> Not a concert. That'd be a weird concert, but also maybe slightly it entertaining. Would be very- it would be slightly entertaining. This is the, the has slapping to sound. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a hose that comes out from the band after a certain song. And then everybody gets hosed down. Yeah. I mean, this is an idea. We'll have to workshop this Yeah, later, it would be but... something we would see at Sturgis, I believe, or Daytona Bike uh, Week. Uh, obviously, it would be Florida. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously. You know what I'm saying? Come on. Panama City, maybe? I mean... But that's great that Sam kind of yeah. opened that door for it, it you. It definitely because- was. Yeah. And, uh, Joe DeRosa, um, he's a comic that, that I've known since L.A. Um, he's always been uh, supportive. He's great. He's a good friend of mine. Uh, the, the the thing coming from, from our industry into comedy is that I already knew a lot of <laughs> comics because a lot of us, we hang out because um, we get, you know, comics get us you know, or, or yes. you know, get porn stars and they're not that judgmental. So that was, um, it was really easy, you know, to transfer into that. But um, yeah, so I already knew people, you know, like Ari Shafir and Jim Norton 
And then when I started doing podcasts and, and stuff like that, of course, the, you know, Robert Kelly and, you know, Anthony Pumia and all those types of people had me on. So I, I was very fortunate to, um, I got, I took a couple steps ahead in, in that sense, because I, I did have a former, you know, career where, where I was in the public eye. I had a publicist my first two years in comedy, not recommended, by the way, anybody, uh, <laughs> definitely not recommended whatsoever. Um, but uh, I, and then I had to take a couple spe- you know, steps back and be like, I actually need to work on the comedy part and not just the, yeah. you know, promoting com- I'm I need to actually. But that was good. a habit because yeah. you had come from the adult industry where that promotion part was so mandatory. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure you just figured, oh, this is going to carry over into this walk of life, mm-hmm. and then you realize, like, okay, it doesn't translate. Yeah, like, it doesn't. It, it doesn't. It doesn't translate actually yeah. just yet. I should roll it back a bit, but. How much do you think being in the adult industry gave you a better sense of humor? Oh, I think just my life in general. <laughs> I think um, that, you know, how, what they say is that um, tragedy plus time equals comedy. So I think <laughs> having, a uh, you know, kind of a rough childhood and, you know, 20s and, and stuff, just being a degenerate and then doing porn. Uh, yeah, no, it definitely has helped with, um, I definitely, I have dark, I have some very dark, uh, thinking kind of jokes that some people, it takes them a minute. And that's one of the things I've learned with my timing is to give them those couple of seconds to actually laugh. Cause if I didn't get a laugh right away, I'm like, Oh my God, the joke sucks. And I'll try to talk. And then people will start laughing because then they finally caught on to the joke. I'm like, all right, now I'm just going to let it sit for a minute. And let them let the wheels turn because not everybody is that smart. <laughs> they don't get. It's kind of like when you're stripping and the crowd isn't loud. All of a sudden, you start feeling like you have to take everything yes! off at one time and the it's pace the exact and same thing. Oh my god! You're like, oh my god, there's no money on the stage right now. What's going yes. on? Okay, let me get naked as well. And then you're like in your first song, and you have four more to go, and you're like, okay, I'm already naked. The, Similar, the right? exact same thing. Yes, because I used to feature dance too. It's the exact same thing. I think that also helped me with uh, with my stage performance and, and stuff like that because being uh, public speaking is normally one of people's biggest fears, and also being naked in public, people seeing you naked. And I've I I don't want to say I've mastered both, but I definitely can do both without oh, no. yeah okay. without batting an eyelash, so, <laughs> which is very comforting, I guess. Well, I mean, like, because they used to say if you're afraid of public speaking, you're supposed to picture everyone else in the room naked. Mm-hmm. Remember that? Yeah, no, I like picture, picture myself head. naked because I've always been more comfortable naked because I always felt I had more power being naked. It, it was stripping and stuff like that, especially when the room full of men because men are dumb. And they just need titties. So you just whip out titties and then you're in control. The world's solution right there. <laughs> just titties. titties. Just titties. <laughs> you know, it's real. And mm-hmm. your pursuit of pivoting, mm-hmm. you know, and just redirecting your life, but still being able to use your fame, mm-hmm. your brand name, mm-hmm. the fact that people know of you. Mm-hmm. How many times do your fans come into your shows and enjoy (laughs) this new walk of life for you? Um, There's been a couple, few. Um, A lot of, as you are familiar with, a lot of porn fans, uh, they tend to be a little quieter. Some some of mine do, um, especially just on social media, because I give off this thing where um, some of my fans are afraid to even come up to me. <laughs> oh, you're so lucky. And get pictures and stuff. <laughs> but no, that's when they start taking like creeper pictures behind. I'm like, you guys could come up and ask for pictures and say hi to me. I'm like, on tw- I'm like, that's that's not me. That's not re- unless I'm eating. Don't come up to me when I'm eating. That drives me nuts. Word. But Word. any other Nothing time. Works. Any other time, you know, well, bath, I've had one girl be like, you look familiar. <laughs> but yeah, I don't, um, most of my fans, um, everyone knows who they are. They're always a very distinct, they always look a very particular way. And uh, so everyone knows, be like, oh, those are Elias fans. <laughs> That's a feverish masturbator over yes. there. He's waiting for Aaliyah. Yes. He's going to say hello later, but he's definitely a feverish masturbator. We can just tell he's a little bit sweaty. Uh, he's super quiet. Well, I get it because you're very quippy on Twitter, which because I know you, mm-hmm. I love all of it. Mm-hmm. Example, right now, 
pinned to your Twitter, which oh. is at the Alia Janine, is picture of a boy and a girl doll. And the caption says something to the extent of it. I may mess it up, but I still love it. Um, tell me where th- that joke hurt you. Yeah, so yeah. It's Show me like on the doll where, where the joke hurt you. <laughs> Because when you go to a therapist, they have you. So something like that, mm-hmm. if somebody doesn't know you, like I saw it and died, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? I was like, this is like, I sent it to my girlfriend. Like, this is the best shit ever. <laughs> if somebody doesn't know you, they may misunderstand mm-hmm. this. And a lot Some of people, people are online do that. Sensitive. Mm-hmm. How often do you deal with negative interactions online when people don't get your jokes? Oh, every day. Every day. <laughs> every day. <laughs> Even yesterday, 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 it's, I have a hilarious joke about Memorial Day. I can only say it around Memorial Day because it's a holiday themed joke. And it's about, um, it goes, uh, Memorial Day is a weird holiday because, you know, nothing says remember our fallen soldiers like a sale on mattresses. <laughs> you know, there's always, and it's always happy Memorial Day. I'm like, that happy and Memorial, that's a weird combination. And I'm like, I do honor Memorial Day because my father was in the Vietnam War. He didn't die in the war. He's just dead to me. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's so funny. He didn't die in the war, but he was dead to you. Okay. <laughs> and he's not so- dead to me. I love my father very much. It's called a joke. And some guy on Instagram yesterday, he's like, did anybody laugh? And I was like, what kind of question? I'm like, and a lot of times I have learned just for my own mental health and stress levels to just not interact. Do not, do not engage, do not engage the trolls. Um, but sometimes depending on my mood, you engage the trolls. Uh, I'm guilty. Of <laughs> I know. I'm guilty. Look, let me show you something. This is an email from a troll that I engaged with. Okay. I just read it on a podcast. Okay. <laughs> Yep. And that's how it is for us. That's how it is for us. It's so, and it's not even just because we were important. I know girls that are just confident. Yeah. Women in general online, like we're constantly getting bombarded by these, you know, very, and it's just insecure dudes. Um, It's just insecure or bored, you know, people who are bored. One dude had a picture with this family and he was talking shit. I'm like, why are you talking shit to me? You have a family. Shouldn't you be spending time with your family? I'm like, you have a daughter. If you don't spend time with her, she's going to end up like me. <laughs> like, go play with your dog. Okay. So I had a guy, this is sometime last year, who was saying nasty shit to me. Like, you know what I get? I get under a sports take or I'm yeah. making a betting pick. I get the uh, right away. Oh, you looked so much better with a dick in your mouth. You looked so much better with a dick in your ass. Mm-hmm. So I go to their profile sometimes because I'm deciding, like, am I muting this person? And of course, it's the banner with his family. And so I write to him. Hey, when your daughter gets into porn, let me know if she needs any advice. <laughs> okay? He was fucking furious. He gets so oh, mad at that. Minute. First of all, you're tweeting about a dick in my mouth while your kids are on your fucking banner. That is a you problem, uh-huh. and your kids are getting in porn. Right. Okay, just letting you know. Okay? <laughs> Secondly... Why do people feel and th- this this very butthurt person? Uh-huh. This is That's about insane. Hundredth email. Okay, this person's now a part of my new list of restraining orders that I will be getting. Yeah. This motherfucker is definitely on that list. He's blocked now, yeah. but he's finding he's setting up all these new emails. Then they come at us. Mm-hmm. Oh well, why are you even bothered by it? Why did you even respond? Why did you fucking send it? Mm-hmm. Okay, let's. Just about shots fired Mm -hmm. you shot first yeah i responded yeah you didn't like it but yes i love throwing the let me help your daughter when she gets to the porn like i I could totally help her i could hook her up with sean michael (laughs) you know always i mean i will make sure (laughs) she has the best gangbang experience you could envision for her because that is right where she's going you and i engage you know when i when i talk with the younger generation Mm -hmm. alia it's fascinating to me Mm -hmm. because they've grown up with all these comments in their life yeah. because they grew up with social media. So they don't fuck with any of it. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my God. Yeah, they just, I, boop, I, I boop, boop. Boop. because they're all about mental health and, and like being positive. And I'm like, fuck that. I'm going to find out where he lives. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hiring a PI. Yeah, so it's going to be fuck. some Jay and Silent <laughs> Bob type shit. Fuck. Yes. And it's really only like maybe once a week. Yeah. I try to limit it to what I used to do it every day. Yeah. <laughs> I used to every day clap back at somebody. Are you kidding? All the time. Yeah. A couple times a day. 
Just be like, yes. fuck, but be like, I'm standing up for myself. And then I realize I'm like, I am wasting too much time. And that's, and that's a lot of it too, is that they just want our attention and they don't know how to get it. They're sad. They're lonely. And a lot of times, a lot of times I've been responding with, I, I hope, uh, you know, whatever you're projecting, you heal from. I, I hope you, you know, you get the help that you need. And some dudes would be like, I'm really sorry. I can't believe I sent that, blah, blah, blah. And other dudes are like, fuck you. I've contacted, especially once on Facebook, because you could find. Oh, yeah. I'll get their family. Family. Get their yes. Family. Yes. You get their family and you send the message to their yeah. family. To their family, to their, their jobs. I had a dude, oh, yeah. I had a dude's mom. He, he, his mom made him write me an apology letter. Yes. 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 I've gotten people Facebook fired. Always, people have gotten fired. Don't, don't fuck with me on Facebook. I can find everything. everything. I can find, your link I can find yes. it. everything is connected to your Facebook, you moron. Yes. I get it. We shouldn't do no. it, but it just feels good. It really And does. sometimes it's cathartic. Now, my new calmer response, mm-hmm. other than helping your daughter get in porn, now when I get the daily, you look better with a dick in your ass. Mm-hmm. Um, I write back, I am so sorry that no one will let you put your Look dick in, that, in their right. ass. <laughs> I know that's what this is about. Yeah. You want your dick in someone's and ass. No one's letting You're you. envious of all the dick that's been in my ass, and this is bothering mm. you on a highest level. So now I'm trying to flip it in my most mm-hmm. antagonistic fucking way mm-hmm. And it's funner that way. I've noticed that, that oh. it's so much fun when you do it that way. Because they don't know how to respond, you know? Then, then it's like, you're a whore and blah, blah, blah. It's like, yes, obviously I was. Thank you for... For acknowledging something that everyone already knew. I'm like, you're so smart. (laughs) Not new data. And also your true fans and friends that know Mm -hmm. you, they laugh at your response. Oh, yeah. My my loyal friends love that shit. I'll post post (laughs) DMs from on Facebook and they're like, this is so funny. They're like, I love it when you do this stuff. Yeah, and it's the real fans that do that. Because if you were a real fan, you would know. Not to talk shit like that. <laughs> it's very simple. Of course. Because our, you know, my girlfriend, who's my assistant, uh, really close, we're, we're like sisters. Mm-hmm. She was at her first event with me, which was a signing at Dave and Buster's here in the city. Mm-hmm. And what surprised her the most that, you know, your true fr- fans show up for an event. Mm-hmm. And most of them admitted how afraid they are of me. Mm-hmm. And I, it made me so, I said, these are the people that truly follow me. They've watched me bitch slap people online. Mm -hmm. They've, they've heard me. They're not thinking they're going to get with me. Like if you ask me on a date on Twitter, I'm like, buddy, you got your apps mixed up. Yeah, sorry. This is fucking Twitter. I'm super (laughs) sorry. Like, sir. Um, And she found that fascinating because our true fans, Mm -hmm. they listen to our narrative. And one of our shared narratives is our love for marijuana. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if you know, but the guys from Exotica are doing a 420 event in Edison in September where they're having a joint rolling contest. You're allowed to bring in six ounces of weed with you. There's going to be a munchie bar inside, food trucks outside, and an outdoor smoking area. We are taking a road Trip yeah, absolutely. Fucking lutely. I'm down. Absolutely. Because I think you might be able to collect some content for your podcast, yes. which is called How to Do <laughs> Drugs. Let's talk about this. Oh, I love the name. The logo is my favorite because it's just the outline of a nose with a little blood drop. Everyone's like, that is so because it's so bold. It's simple. It's so simple, but it makes such a statement. Like such a fucking <laughs> statement. <laughs> um, well, you know, I've had I have had other podcasts. I believe I've had you on that one, uh, hormones, and that was um, that podcast was based off of myself and my co-host, me being more sexually open, and then uh, the the two co-hosts, three co-hosts that I've had, um, they were more sexually conservative, and and so it was our different views on different topics and stuff like that. And um, I was kind of, you know, being in comedy longer. I've been in comedy eight years now. And I just, um, I wanted to kind of get away from that. Like, I'm good at it. Everyone knows I can suck a dick. You know, it's not rocket science. So I'm like, what else am I really good at? And I'm like, oh, I'm really good at doing drugs. So, (laughs) and driving and sometimes driving while on drugs, but we don't talk about that. (laughs) So I'm like, let's do a podcast about drugs. Um, and so that's how that came about. Um, yeah, it's, and this is you solo. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. It's just, which I love because now you realize something, Aaliyah, you are a solo host. Yeah. It's hard to work with other people. 
It, no, it's, it's it's hard. And also you end up getting stuck in that identity of when you started the podcast, mm-hmm. and you don't really get to pivot and, and weave. Whereas when you're solo, mm-hmm. you really get to, and also like, you're so much more confident than you were, yeah. you know, eight years ago when you started doing comedy, it makes perfect sense that you should have your own space. Yeah. But I'm sure you've learned a lot about people. I'm coming up to be a guest on yes. your show. We're going to do it in person. We're definitely going to smoke some weed that yes, day together absolutely. because that's part of the podcast. Mm-hmm. We have to do the podcast yes. elevated, <laughs> as I like to say, or, you know, vitamins, vitamins. as you call them on the my radio. Medicine. I need my drugs. medicine. <laughs> my medicine. What have you learned about people's drug habits oh. and what are you teaching? What am I teaching? Well, I'm trying not to teach anything. Uh, that's, that's, <laughs> please don't, please don't follow my example at all. Most of you would probably die to be perfectly honest. <laughs> A lot of you would be dead. Because you do not have the tolerance I, that I, she has. I don't think you have the tolerance, especially when it comes to hallucinogenics. I will blow you out of the water. <laughs> it's not something to brag about. Um, I've learned, um, I've learned a lot about uh, why people become so why people, you know, started abusing drugs, because there is a difference, you know, between recreational use and then really becoming dependent on them. Um, you, know, you know, what causes people to become dependent on them. Um, I've had I've had a doctor on an addiction specialist, actually a psychologist. He's an amazing dude. Um, he He's also an MD. So he um, he actually uses like like medications to help people, you know, wean off of heroin sure. and, and stuff like that. Yep. Um, it's basically, it's just people telling their stories. Um, and I've had people who've never used before, you, you know, who, who don't really use drugs or alcohol, barely drink. And they explain, you know, why they, why they, you know, are like that, why, why they choose not to drink. Um, and it's just fascinating. It's just, you know, it's just a conversation about, you know, people's personal experiences with, with drugs. I've had, um, I've had a couple, I've had a homeless dude on that used to hang out in the village all the time. He's clean now. He lives out you know, in the Midwest. So um, it's, I've had everyone from Tommy Chong on to, you know, uh, a homeless dude from the fucking <laughs> West Village. So it's, it's just a wide variety of guests and their different stories and stuff of, of, with drugs. Because I think it, it is another topic like sex that, that needs to be talked about more, especially with mental health and, and things like that. I think with OnlyFans, you know, especially over quarantine and stuff like that, I think the idea of sex work is is becoming less stigmatized. I'm like, it's definitely got some way to go, but it, you know, when your freaking nurse, you know, is showing her titties on OnlyFans, it's kind of, it's becoming more it's weird though. It is a little I weird. Still, <laughs> I, here's what I believe. I still believe if you, I still believe that OnlyFans kind of leapfrogged porn stars. Like it's totally okay yeah. for someone to have an OnlyFans because people can still believe she's not showing anything yeah, or she's yeah. not doing anything. Right. But if you're a porn star, there's that's well known. Mm-hmm. There's still a shit ton of judgment. But if you're a housewife that started it uh-huh. only fans it seems to be different yeah. so i don't i don't know if it neutralized all of us no i, I like I to call them i call them the um the um dollar tree whores <laughs> that's amazing. That's amazing. i call them dollar that is did you buy the domain yet? Dollar. Oh, shit. Please, you should probably buy it right now. the fucking domain right now. It's not on hold. Because, dude, that is fucking amazing. I mean, that would be a great name for a podcast. The Dollar Tree Horse. It's so funny. But you're right. And that, see, this is this is why we've always really vibed. Because you, I get your sense mm-hmm. of humor. Other people would be truly like, what does she mean? I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, I get how quippy. and that, But that is fucking hilarious. And it's true. So, like, I do believe... Mm-hmm that it did break the stigma to a degree. Mm-hmm. But yet I still hear people like, oh yeah, she's on OnlyFans, but she's not really showing anything. I'm like, well, did you, have you signed up? Mm-hmm. Like, do, are you doing the research? Yeah. How is she making $100,000 a month and yeah. she's not showing anything? Yeah. Okay, Because I know a lot of people doing a lot of shit and not making, a, oh no, no, no. But, so it's, it's, it's a strange place, yeah, right? Yeah. It's like, People feel like OnlyFans is behind this barrier, which it kind of is because if you work for porn studios, your shit's going to get pulled and put on tube mm-hmm. sites. But what OnlyFans models do not realize is their stuff is guess where Reddit. Yeah. Reddit is the new secondhand OnlyFans. Mm-hmm. And I know this because I have a friend who searches Reddit for me to get my stuff taken down. Mm-hmm. And he's like, yo, Reddit 
is everyone's only fans for free. Mm-hmm. Everyone steals con. So you actively have to have somebody going on there regularly. Plan only fans is great. If you report mm-hmm. it, you know, they get it taken down too, but I don't think these people know that their stuff is also on. I've, I've told a bunch of people about some people don't care. I told them about, you know, take down piracy, Nate glass and, and his company. He said that he works with only fans. I've given, you know, that, the um, his contact to a couple different, you know, cause a bunch of comedians have it now. Yeah. That that's the reason. Cause I had an only fans, um, a couple of years ago, I want to say maybe five years ago. And someone had told me, he's like, Oh, some of your stuff is, you know, up on Reddit. I'm like, take it down. And then I shut it down. I was like, no, um, this is one of the reasons why I quit porn in general. You guys just keep, keep stealing the stuff. Then you don't get to see the titties. Sorry. Right. Yeah, just hold them back. So that's been neutralized. And I think in states that have legalized marijuana, mm-hmm. we talk a lot about marijuana. Mm-hmm. There are more conversations about microdosing and psychedelics more than ever. Mm-hmm. But I still think there's this weird people are very much hiding what their habits may be, which isn't safe, especially mm-hmm. with so much fentanyl coming into the country. Like you're better off being more open about your habits. Than yes. Your source. Yes. It's so important. There's also different places where you could buy testing kits and, and, and stuff like that. I, um, I got a new psychiatrist and I was, um, I went to see him cause I have ADHD and I, and I wanted to get a prescription for Adderall, but I was very honest about, you know, my previous cocaine and sometimes current cocaine use. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's my favorite. I'm like, obviously it's my favorite. I have fucking ADHD. Obviously it's my favorite. And had you known this years ago, you would have just been doing Ritalin this whole time and saving yourself a shit ton of oh, money, getting it through your insurance. Jesus about how much money Christ. you have in so money. Money right now. Well, it was funny because I remember when we were in school, um, we were younger and this girl's like, oh, it's called Ritalin here. Take some. And me and this other dude were like, we don't really feel it. And we didn't get why we didn't feel it. <laughs> we're meant to be taking it. <laughs> and you use a testing kit when you buy products? Um, yeah. Uh, well, I, I had my drug dealers buy the testing kit, so I didn't have to. But yeah, I have a testing kit um, just for um, for that. But you can also get it for um, MDMA. This is why I love the Netherlands. Uh, my buddy, who he's American, but he moved there. Um, Because most drugs are legal. You actually, if you buy Molly or MDMA from someone you don't really know, you can send it to the government and they will test it for you. And then send it back to you. And then send it back. And I'm like, I want the government to send me some Molly. What? That sounds amazing. So, and know that it's good. Yeah. And safe. A great response Mm -hmm. to it because you're not in your head. Because Molly and MDMA is very much in your head. Mm -hmm. So if you're worried about it Mm -hmm. then it's not gonna if you got it back letter from the government hey this shit is good good. have a great time you know party (laughs) on you take that stuff and be like let's go okay (laughs) well now and we're living it oh go ahead it's not as safe right now if you don't have a testing yeah you definitely i don't really um i don't really mess with molly or ecstasy that much anymore um not for years i i had Someone gave me a pill a couple of years, um, not a couple of years ago, a couple of months ago. I think I may still have it, to be honest. Um, I've pretty much stuck with, uh, with I like mushrooms. I've been getting into DMT more. I have a DMT vape pen, which I really, really like. Um, and then acid. I have a bunch of acid. And when, when I trip, I like to, um, I'll either trip like hard or I'll just do a microdose because I'm out in public, you know with work people or (laughs) whatever you don't want to be too fucked up but yeah i try to um to stay away from from doing like copious amounts basically i i I have a new bit about when you're younger you do drugs because you really want to get fucked up and now you know i think i I, you've heard this joke but um now i microdose because i'm sad you know it does actually (laughs) help (laughs) microdosing helped help me get out of like a three-year depression and uh, it really did. If you use it the way that, you know, that that to help you, you know, you can yeah. actually really help you with depression, with PTSD, with anxiety. Um, and it's also, you know, you do enough and it's also very fun. Yes, obviously. <laughs> I had a friend that just did a guided mm-hmm. three day um, microdose journey with his doctor in Canada. Nice. 
and uh, she stayed with him. She was present, walked him through it. He was dealing with the trauma of his father passing mm-hmm. away, and it really helped him. Um, and, it, and it's something that they're using a lot mm-hmm. in Canada that we're just not on. We're starting the conversation, yeah. but we're not really getting there. But like when you say someone gave you an ecstasy pill and you still don't think you use it, remember the 90s? I miss the 90s. Because I can tell you what. In the 90s, that pill would not have lasted five minutes before it was down the hatch. It would have been already, yeah, it would have already been gone. Already. Actually, I need, I, can rem- I wonder where they are now that I think about it. I, I, I can remember going to Vegas and being like, we're going to stay here till we've finished all of these yeah. and just having like 40 and there's three of us. And I'm like, this is going to be great. It's so much fun. And then like for the next month later, you're like, why do I feel like this? Why am I so sad? But I also felt great because I was very lean. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there was that. It's very lean after a four day bender like that. So skinny. We so thin, so thin. We would do them and then we would like walk at sunset, like all the way up one side of this strip and like down the other, just like total comfy clothes, you know, just walking and people watching. It was, we were just out like little kids exploring. Mm-hmm. It was just, you know, and we're hurting anybody. Yeah. We weren't bothering, but we had the time of our lives. I think the 90s were a blip for me for that reason. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I miss the 90s. They were a good time. I miss my pager. Really- I miss just having a pager. I don't want fucking Twitter. I don't want a cell phone. I want my pager and I want to send people boobies. Or you spell out boobies with eight zero zero one three five or whatever. Or you write high upside down with a H and a and then number one. You know, you're like, yeah. Listen, the access people have to us now oh. and what this generation that grew up with it doesn't understand. Mm-hmm. When I grew up, when you grew up, your parents never got a phone call at home from work. No. And my dad would take the phone off the hook during dinner mm-hmm. and we didn't hear it beeping for a couple of minutes till that thing and, that, yeah. and then it goes away because he didn't want a telemarketer to call because that was when telemarketers first started calling. He would get irate. Yep. It would ruin like everything. Mm-hmm. Irate. And here we are in this world now where everyone feels like, I think her phone is in her hand. I sent her a text 10 minutes ago and she didn't respond. And then they're like melting down Mm -hmm. when you finally do pick your, you're you're recording a podcast, Mm -hmm. you're doing an episode of how to do drugs. You're not texting back. No, or you're busy or maybe you just don't want to text. That's the thing is people think that, and I granted I've been that person too. It'd be like, yo, especially if it's a dude, you can't look at my fucking stories when I just texted you and you need to respond to this text message. That's called codependency. And I've learned about that. I've gotten better with it. Thank you. But yeah, no, it is annoying. <laughs> okay. Would you bring up the story thing? It's funny you say that. Cause remember when I was an agent, mm-hmm. first job I ever had, <laughs> um, when I was an agent, I would be trying to reach a girl to like get her tested. Mm-hmm. Of course, she can't shoot. I'm gonna have to cancel. And no answer, no answer, no responding to the text, but yet tweeting like a motherfucker. Yeah. And I'd be like, oh, I see I'm you. I see you right now. Why are <laughs> Just answer your fucking door. And I would, I would say, I'm doing my whole homework. Mm-hmm. I see you. Okay, I know. I'm doing my whole homework. I know where you is right now. You are glued to your Twitter and you won't respond. Yeah. But it's just a different world, the constant, but. I'm sure it helps with your joke writing because people yeah. hold nothing back nowadays. Yeah. I'm sure dating, you get a lot of material because people yeah. are just a hot mess. Well, I mean, yeah, there's no boundaries, but I also like, I lack certain boundaries because there is that thing where, where you want to be upfront and honest with somebody, but, um, and you don't want to hide stuff. But when they ask you, you know, like, like, Oh, what did your dad, you know, what does your dad do? I'd be like, Oh, well he used to kill people for money. Allegedly, according to my mother, <laughs> So like that's about like that's like maybe third fourth date type stuff, not first date type stuff. So yeah, I have that problem, especially with the porn stuff. And I mean you too. I mean you're fucking you're like the fucking most famous porn star in the world. So going out on a date for you has to be horrible. Like I can't download Tinder or Hinge. I'm not on any of those apps because people recognize me right the fuck away. And then yeah, and then like how do you tell a guy who doesn't know? And then it's that weird thing. It's like wait, you don't know. It's like, how do you, <laughs> so that's like, I have to have, like, if I'm dating someone, um, they have to know that I've already done it because just trying to tell that story is just so 
annoying. <laughs> well, also because if they don't know mm -hmm. and you tell them, their follow-up questions are very different. Right away, mm -hmm. they think there was a ton of trauma and you were forced yes. and they want to know that you were forced into it because they can't accept you did it on your free will. Yeah. I met somebody last year. Mm -hmm. It's the first person I had met in years that didn't know who I was. Holy shit. So I did a social experiment with him mm -hmm. and I sat down with him face to face and like told him. And first I asked him if he had been in prison or like what he, what rock he'd been under. Like, how could you not know? I'm not the being. Yeah, like, but it's dude, still, yeah. I don't go. And his list of questions were, I said, I'll allow you to ask me three to five questions. Mm -hmm. The first question was like, are you guys naturally wet during a scene or do you always use lube? But I'm like, okay, this guy is no sex bird. Wow. Second question was, do the women make more money than the men? I was like, yes, we do yes. this a bit, but it was, it was, it was a bizarre, it was a bizarre experience because yeah. you're right. Everybody does know. Mm -hmm. And then we also have to be again, the whole detective mm -hmm. where it's like, are you with me? to go out only because of that? Mm -hmm. Or are you with me to have sex with me, but then you never want anything more yeah. just because it's like a conquest to yeah. stay there with us. I'm like, like oh, that, that's going to be a thousand dollars then, bub. No, I'm just <laughs> I have a rate for that. <laughs> it's 1300 inflation. I mean, if you're paying 650 for fucking gas, that's, that's right. I guess I didn't count inflation. inflation. The rates probably have gone up since I've done it. Has <laughs> what world are we living in? Oh my gosh, Aaliyah. <laughs> I cannot wait. So I can't wait to, I've saved experiences for you. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to talk about my first experiences with drugs when I do your podcast. Yes. Yes. I'm so drugs. excited. Um, some of my favorite experiences, some of my like worst experiences, mm -hmm. I will just say, um, I was at the Meadowlands with my friends at a Pink Floyd concert and I will tell that full detailed <laughs> story about what the prank my friends played on me uh, that scared the bejesus out of me, um, on acid, <laughs> of course, <laughs> on acid. Course. And we all lied about going mm -hmm. and we had a, one friend that was old enough to rent a vehicle. He also should not have been driving. And we ended up going, supposed to be going from the Meadowlands back to Pennsylvania. We ended up in Maryland and had to call all of our parents like, hey, we're not going to make it to school today. Somehow we just realized we're in Maryland and it was not a good scene. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds amazing. We had the time of our lives though. Yeah. <laughs> so those are always the best times when you're not supposed to be doing <laughs> when you're a kid. Of course. Where can everybody, I know you do a lot of shows in New York yes. City. Where can everybody find you? I know probably the best place is just to go to aliajanine.com and like click, but people have a very hard time clicking a link. Like I tell people yeah. like the link is in the bio. What part of the link is in the bio? Do you not? But it's even been in it. Do. I've had a person ask for the link from the tweet that the link was in uh, before. I'm like, it's, it's, we have this. it's right. It's, it's we have right this. there. I promote my book. The link is right it's, there. It says click here. Click. And they're like, where can I get your book? Like, uh, that click here button. It's right, it's right there. It's the fucking button. <laughs> it's, the button. <laughs> it's the fucking button. Um, yes. Uh, you can find, uh, my schedule, my calendar, all that fun stuff on aliajanine.com you can find me on twitter the aliyah janine uh instagram aliyah.janine uh and facebook uh aliyah janine and that yeah that's it and you are a regular at the stand and i've been telling everyone in this city you need to go to the stand because the food is so beautiful mm -hmm. there's a nice bar you, you after the show you can still hang out there mm -hmm. it's not that feeling of like you gotta usher out no, make a decision no, they, make it, it's, it's, the they have the nice little lounge like bar area upstairs yeah. they have two showrooms one in the basement one upstairs and they actually now they have a big curtain for that glass so now you can't look in yeah. and which is always kind of distracting when you're up there because everyone because sometimes you can still hear the music so it's a really thick curtain yeah so it's great yeah and the food is fucking the food is phenomenal the food is phenomenal but i am so <laughs> glad that we reconnected yes. and i got to see you and you made me laugh yeah. i love everything you're doing thank Aaliyah you. janine everybody give her a follow yay thank you so much for having me if you are done laughing now and really enjoyed that as much as I did, pulling clips was so funny. I was laughing out loud. And so, you know, when I was pulling clips, I texted Aaliyah and I said, Aaliyah, did you buy the Dollar Tree Horrors domain yet? She texts me. She's like, oh my God, I didn't look. She screen grabs it. It's available. Buys it. Okay. Okay, good. Because I cannot release this podcast with these clips until you buy that domain because I'm such a domain hoarder myself. 
You can follow Aaliyah on Instagram, Aaliyah.Janine. You can follow Aaliyah on Twitter at the Aaliyah Janine and her podcast, How Did You Drugs? Find out about her comedy and everything that she is doing in one easy space. That is AaliyahJanine.com. It is time for us to get to the moment you've all been waiting for, the Ask Lisa Ann mailbag. If you have a question, send it to me at AskLisaAnn at gmail.com. All right, here we go. If you're a fan of Dudes Do Better, which is also available on my YouTube channel, then go back and watch last week and understand why I'm trying to keep it clean right here. We're trying to sage these podcasts. We're trying to get rid of any negative, weird energy. I don't have to explain myself. You have to go and figure it out. So we've got some good emails in here. I'm keeping it short and sweet, but this subject matter is the subject of skiing. Dear Lisa Ann, to begin with, I would like to extend you a belated thank you for your response to my last email. Your offer of future support to my next charity event made my day. The gesture is greatly appreciated. So this writer has been a listener. And by the way, I'm just not mentioning names because of some drama that's going on, but you know who you are. Be proud of yourself for writing this email. This writer of this email reached out to me uh, a bit ago. I may have read the email to you saying that uh, he had just put himself in the mix and did his first charity event. And it was a great way to meet new people. And it was a great activity to add to his life. So I wrote back, Well, the next time you do another charity event, you have to let me know because I have to donate to your charity event because that's how this works. For those of you out there getting involved because of me, please let me be a part of the community that helps you raise money for the amount of times that you have helped me raise money. It continues with, I'm a former skier and I would like to ask you two questions. One, Do you tend to favor the black diamond slopes or do you mix it in with blue diamond slopes and beginner slopes as well? When you negotiate a steep slope, do you simply shoot straight down or do you use a more conservative style of going side to side? Thanks again for your kind words of encouragement. Keep on charging. Number one question, I definitely favor black diamond. Now, I will say when I was in Breckenridge, Colorado, it's so amazing. It's such a long lift ride. And then you have all these choices. And some of the slopes that are more remediate are like they lead you to another choice of like six or so. We really mix it up that day. But I'm always going to go for the most difficult uh, because that's what I like. And that's challenging. But I all go down a beginner. But I don't want to go down a beginner slope at a fast pace and throw off somebody that might be learning. So that's kind of why I would stay in the mid ground before beginner, just because I don't want to be a terror and then throw off somebody who's just learning. When the second question was, do I like to go straight down or side to side? I will only go so fast until I slow myself down with some side to side, because at 50, you're smart enough to know that the faster the speed, the greater the impact. So When I know I'm pushing myself to a point where like, if you crash and burn right now, it would hurt. That's when I usually reel it in a little bit, but I don't love to go side to side anymore for a full-time ski because snowboarders go at a different pace. You got skiers going really fast on black diamonds. So I find that I will just go fast. Then I'll kind of go over and slow down a little bit. And then I'll go fast again, go over and slow down a little bit. But I love to ski. I want to get out even more. Thank you to Fit Soda for taking me on the greatest ski trip of 2022. And mind you, also my only ski trip, but it was the greatest ski trip. And I will say in the beginning of the year, I kept saying to my friends, like, yeah, I'm definitely going to ski this winter. You know, and they were like, well, when are you planning your ski trip? I'm like, I don't know. I'm definitely going to ski this winter. I just manifested that. I just put it out to the universe. And then when finally I got on the call with, with Bev Boss, who you have seen here on the Lisa Ann Experience a couple of weeks ago. Again, if you're new to this podcast, go back and listen. Great story about Kuyos and Fit Soda, who is my proud sponsor right here at the Lisa Ann Experience. Um, it happened. We started talking. I'm like, I want to ski. And then there it was. Took me till late February to put it together, but I did it. I got out there on a ski trip and it was awesome. And I'm so thankful. Okay. We need some relationship advice here. So our friend says, random shot in the dark here. I'm an extremely impatient sexual human married to the love of my life who's given birth three times. And after the last clitoris sensitivity is at an all time high. I'm a handsy lover. I like to give it to my wife 
but my wife is extremely sensitive and doesn't communicate well. I'm just dying to give back. Well, to my writer right here, you need to adapt. Your wife has adapted her entire body to make three beautiful children for the two of you. So if that is a sensitive area, then you just can't be as handsy with it. You're going to have to be more gentle and delicate. And if communication is a real problem, you could watch some sex counselors online. You can watch some docu documentaries, but you have to really start the conversation. Also know that this might not be as sensitive forever. She may recover from this and feel back to normal, but no matter what, live in the gratitude of the life that you've created. As a matter of fact, three lives that you've created and reel it back a bit. You've probably had a beautiful sexual life and I'm not asking you to never have sex again, or I'm not asking you to never get what you think you want, but life takes us through stages and different levels and have empathy for the stage and level that your wife is at celebrate how much you love her and find other ways to please her for this time. That's my advice on that one. A couple more here. Thank you for liking my YouTube comment. Anyway, this is considered a question about having kids from the Sam Roberts show that I hope doesn't make you think I'm a creeper. Would you have allowed yourself to have a kid a long time ago if you could 100% or guarantee privacy for that child? So I've mentioned the fact, you know, once the internet happened, I was pretty sure I was not having kids. Like I knew I didn't want kids from the jump, but then that was when I was like, oh yeah, this is gonna be way too complicated. I've known I didn't want children my entire life. It's just not for everybody. I grew up with a lot of indifference with my parents, and I know that I would have no grandparents to take my children and introduce them to. I would have no family support and no extended family on my end, which isn't always the ideal situation to have children. I'm also an incredible forward thinker. And since we had on Elena, I've been doing a lot of thinking about medium work and uh, people who could see into the future. And I've been pleasantly surprised by the understanding that I can remember telling people what the world was going to be like now when I was young. Like, oh, the world's going to be in a circus. You know, people are going to be crime and it's going to be out of control and greed is going to take them. And my young friends who were teenagers who were starting to have babies in high school, and I would tell them like, yeah, I don't want to do this. I don't want the responsibility of bringing somebody into this. There's no way to, I just don't want to do this. And also keep in mind, I come from a huge family. Um, 35, 36 first cousins, all of my, you know, cousins would often have five or six kids. It just didn't appeal to me because I didn't want to stay home all the time. I love to travel. I love to be free, to be out, to be responsible for just myself and my two house plants, which by the way, this one is almost asking for its own room. It's taking over so much, but it's just not for everyone. So no, even if I could have protected their privacy, I knew very young, I didn't want the responsibility of children. I wanted to be free and live my own life. My greatest friend, Peggy, who many people have heard we talk about many times, she but didn't have children. She wasn't able to have children. But what I saw in her life was that she lacked nothing. She gave to everybody else and loved people like they were her children. She had so much freedom in her existence and still had so many people around her and felt love unconditionally. So kids just weren't something I want. I am not changing my mind. I will never change my mind. I am more sure than ever. Two more to go here and then we're wrapping this bad boy up. I am 37 years old and I've had a couple of relationships with most of the girls I've been with have had boyfriends or husbands. Okay. So I'm just letting you know, before I finish reading this email, you are not in a relationship with somebody that has a boyfriend or a husband. A relationship is when you are the boyfriend or the husband. I can't find someone to settle with. This person says, and I've been told by the other girls that I'm a great guy and lover. And even they don't understand why I'm still single at this point. What do I think is the problem? And what do you recommend me to do? Well, I think your problem is you're dating people that aren't available. Someone that has a boyfriend or a husband is not available. You need to find somebody that's single. That is your first step. You need to go out there and meet other people like yourself. You need to get involved in different activities. You need to be more social. But dating people who are not available does not mean you're dating. So find people that are available and no more dating people that are in other relationships. It's bad karma. Last email here in the mailbag right here. Again, asklisaann at gmail.com if you want to send me a question. This is a great one. Ending it on a high note. Yes, I have a question. 
How do you stay so positive? You mean, I mean, you're always in great form. I always like to see you on Twitter. For example, you are so positive and you always cheer me up. I love this email. Thank you so much. All the way from Ireland. You know, it's a state of mind. And I've also learned that if I'm having a day where I don't feel as positive or I'm just a little sluggish or what have you, that means my body is telling me that I need to take a me day. Do a get right day. I call them get right days. Get right days could be like I go get a massage. I go to the nail salon. I stay in and do laundry and chores. I, I'm not as social for a period of time till I refill my tank. But my start experience with being this positive was from The Secret. Can a podcast go by without me pitching The Secret? But I'm not pitching it. I truly do believe in it. I too, truly do believe in the shift in mindset by realizing that like attracts like. And if I'm out there being positive, I'm going to go out there and meet other people being positive. So I feel right about it. Even the little bit of toxicity I'm feeling from the interaction from the creeper conversations on dudes is a bit jarring for me because I like positive energy around me. And this is kind of pushing negative energy towards me and I've got to push back positive energy. But it is the way to be because the more positive you are, you see the bright side. Look, things go wrong every day. I was out to lunch yesterday with Aaliyah Janine. One time I'm not by my computer during the day on a weekday. And Sinner reaches out to me. She's like, oh no, the podcast ended abruptly. The interview doesn't finish. And I was like, okay, okay, well, here I am. I'm not by my computer. I can't fix it right now. And I said to her, okay, well, no big deal. I'll leave it up till I get back. When I get back, I will fix it. And then I'll take down the other one and move it on the day. And so I finished, I got off the phone. I finished eating with Aaliyah. And I said, you know, things are going to go wrong, but it's how we respond to them. I didn't rush through my lunch with her. We sat and talked afterwards. I knew it would get fixed, but it's about having that positive. This is not the worst thing ever. And I'm so happy to be sitting across the table from a friend that everything else can wait. It's how you view things. Staying positive is if you notice the bad more than the good. If you are feeling bad, make a quick list of things that you're grateful for. You're grateful for your health. You're grateful for clean water. You're grateful for food. You're grateful for this just serious basics. These are things that not everybody has. So living in gratitude is a game changer and bring people around you that make you laugh, bring you joy and help you share those positive vibes. I love these emails. They were all so great. Yes, I had to scour to find them, but they were there. I want more positive energy like this. Send it to AskLisaAnn at gmail.com. Coming up in July, July 15th through 17th, I will be in Miami signing at the Bad Dragon booth at Exotica. If you didn't, go back and listen to the episode from last week with Jay and Dan from Exotica. They talk all about how they came up with the show, the years we've been doing it together. We're so like family. Then July 29th, I will be at the Dave & Buster's in Nashville, Tennessee. Another signing so you can get your book personally autographed in person, whether you bought it on Amazon, whether you're going to buy it from me in person. And I will continue to keep you updated on my events. Coming up in July, we'll be changing the time of the live premiere to 8 p.m. Eastern time on Friday nights. And we can kick back some Friday night action just together, just chilling before we get ready for the weekend. I thank you all so much for listening, for being a part of my world. If you are new to the podcast, please subscribe. Also subscribe to my YouTube channel. Go over and check out my books, The Life and the life back at my store, shoplisaann.com. I thank you all so much for listening. Give me that thumbs up on YouTube. It all helps. I appreciate you. Have a great rest of your day. Don't forget to follow Aaliyah Janine, all things aaliyahjanine.com. See her stand up live. She is hilarious. And for you, have a great rest of your day. And thank you for listening to another episode of the Lisa Ann Experience. Thank you.